Okay, so we saw that the notion of GDTs and LDTs exists. So now let's dig into these data structures that are inside of each of those tables. So those are called segment descriptors and each entry in the GDT and LDT is called a segment descriptor and a segment descriptor describes a segment. So each segment has a segment descriptor which specifies the size of the segment, the access rights, the privilege level for the segment and the segment type location of the first byte in the segment in the linear address space called the base address. So something about these segment descriptors has to do with privilege level. So Sonic's totally here for it. All right, but first let's uh, dig in with a single bit that helps us understand this uh, Black Manta finite state machine. So within a segment descriptor is a field called the L flag, which stands for the long mode flag. This is bit 21, and this specifies whether or not this segment describes a 64-bit segment or not. And if it's set to one, then it's a 64-bit memory segment, and if it's set to zero, then it's not. So looking at that finite state machine, we can see that is what they were trying to tell us right here. They said, if the code segment register, which has a segment selector in it, points at a segment that has the L bit set, then that means that it's operating in 64-bit mode. If the code segment selector points at a segment that has the L bit equal to zero, then you're in compatibility mode, then you're in 32-bit mode. So this is our first understanding about you know, how to move between these different uh, capabilities. So you would expect that an operating system that wants to support 64-bit code execution and 32-bit is going to have different segment selectors with L set and L not set. All right, but the, the most important bits of a segment selector usually, or segment descriptor rather, usually, are the base address. And the base address is actually only 32 bits here. So that's kind of a problem, right? We're dealing with 64-bit address space. Well, that's because this base address is only actually used in compatibility mode. So we said before that in 64-bit mode, the change to the architecture is that for CS, SS, DS, and ES, the base is just always hard coded to zero. So we saw how, for instance, you know, writing to a segment register would cause it to look up some entry in the table. These are what those entries look like. And that would load this kind of data from these tables into the hidden portion of the segment register. But we said that CS, SS, DS, and ES were always hard coded to zero in their hidden portion. They weren't actually grabbing the base from here. Now for FS and GS, uh, the 32-bit portion of this base could be pulled from this segment descriptor, but the more relevant bit is that there's a couple of model specific registers and essentially the hidden part of the segment register has been expanded to 64 bits and mapped into these architectural MSR registers, the IA32 FS base and IA32 GS base. And so software that actually wants to set a full 64-bit base address for FS and GS segments has to do so via these model-specific registers. So we showed previously that you know, when AMD was making the 64-bit extensions, they kind of modified it to do what everyone did already, CSDS, SS, ES, they were always pretty much pointing at giant flat memory spaces anyways, but we said FS and GS could point at specific data structures. So that's what we saw before, and what you're now learning is that that hidden portion of the segment registers that we said was always kind of lurking there in the background, but which you couldn't access. Well, for FS and GS specifically and only, there's no version for CS, SS, DS, or ES, for these two segment registers only, the hidden portion has been expanded to 64 bits and has been mapped to these model specific registers and so hardware can or sorry software can go ahead and fill in the values in these model specific registers in order to create a segment that maps anywhere within the 64-bit address space so that has some interesting implications for this table that we saw before when we were comparing you know user space and kernel space things at the time we said that fs and gs look exactly the same but now we have to question that if they have the same segment registers that doesn't necessarily 
necessarily mean that they actually are pointing to the same memory in user space and kernel space, because now we know that the memory can actually be specified by those model specific registers. So the kernel could be swapping around the model specific registers rather than changing out the segment selectors, seeing as how the segment descriptor is not super interesting because only 32 bits of the address come from there and that's not a full address. And so probably people aren't going to use that. But anyways, we're going to come back to this at a later time when we want to dig back into it. For now, we want to keep understanding these segment descriptors in the GDT and LDK. So we just saw the base and we said, well, that's a 32-bit value that's only really used in 32-bit mode now. There's also the limit, which is a 20-bit value, which specifies you know, the size of the uh, segment. It could either be specified in bytes or in four kilobyte blocks, as we'll see in the next slide. So it specifies a size, but this is only going to be used in compatibility mode. In 64-bit mode, the limit is not actually checked anymore, not even for FS and GS. So it doesn't really care. FS and GS, it just has a base register in the uh, model-specific register, and then it doesn't care if there is any sort of access anywhere within a range. So it is the G flag, the granularity flag, which says whether or not those segment limits are in bytes or in 4096 byte chunks, aka a page size chunk, which we'll learn about later. And so that's again only a 32-bit value, 32-bit uh, relevant bit uh, in 64-bit mode that is not even going to be used. All right, then there's a present flag. If this is zero, this entire thing is treated as not present, not valid. And so this is, you know, should not be interpreted or used. And if it's one, then it means, yes, okay, someone did actually fill in this entry in the GDT or LDT, uh, and it can be considered to be pointing at a valid segment. And so just a little comment that, you know, if the flag is clear and someone tries to access that segment, there's going to be an exception that's thrown. So some sort of error is going to occur if someone tries to access a non-present segment. We also have the S flag, which is a counterintuitive flag where zero means it's a system segment and one means it's a code or data segment. So despite being the S flag or the system flag, zero indicates it's a system descriptor as opposed to one meaning it's a system descriptor. So that's backwards and you know it's so backwards that even when I was uh, looking at this plugin that we're going to use for WinDebug in a while, some third-party plugin, they had made the mistake of assuming that if S was one that it was a system segment, but it's the opposite. Then we have type flags. So this is four bits, and depending on whether it's a system or non-system segment, there's going to be four bits specifying 16 different types that you can have for system and non-system segments, as we'll see on this sort of diagram. So let's assume it is not a system segment. It is a code and or data segment. Well, of code and data segments, there are two major chunks. There's data segments, and there's code segments. Within each of those, there's subdivisions of read-only and read-only accessed that you know the hardware will use to indicate whether or not some particular area of memory has been accessed. So there's read-only and there's read-write. There's read-only expand down, which is upside down, and read-write expand down. Then there's also code for execute only and execute read. And we'll come back to that in a second. So what was the point of expand down data segments? Well, that was originally for stack segments to allow them to grow towards lower addresses because as you learned in architecture one, 1001, the stack grows towards lower addresses. Uh, it's actually the case that you cannot create a read-only expand down segment for stack segments because there will be an error, but that's just trivia, which I probably shouldn't have even bothered to include because nobody uses expand down segments that I know of. All right, then in the code segments, there were actually two types. There were conforming segments and there were non-conforming segments. And these are interesting from a privilege and security perspective. Conforming segments allow lower privilege code to execute them. So if you created a conforming code segment and it said, I'm a ring zero segment, it would actually allow ring three code to go and execute that ring zero code. So basically it allows lower privileged code to run in the context of a higher privileged segment. That's generally not what people want. They usually want what are called non-conforming segments. And they behave in a way that if a given chunk of memory is described as a ring zero segment, then only ring zero code can execute it. And any attempt for ring three code to jump into that code will cause an error. So you should be a non-conformist and you should generally be using non-conforming segments. 
Now, what is the point of those conforming segments? Well, if you think back to the Intel notion of, you know, ring zero is the kernel, ring three is user space, and rings one and two are for system services, then maybe you could imagine that the operating system might want to allow code to jump from ring three into ring two, even though it's, you know, a higher privilege segment, but still execute that before dropping down. Again, the notion is that uh, ring two versus three is not that big of a privilege change, whereas ring zero versus ring three is, right? So here's the picture to help you visualize it, right? So we said ring three is user space code, ring two, maybe they should be allowed to execute some ring two code and then come back down to ring three. That would be something that would be possible if you were designing things this way. But as we said, nobody designs things that way. Everybody throws all of their code into ring zero, and therefore they need to strictly keep ring three out, which means they should be using a non-conforming code segment for ring zero. All right, so going back to this, those uh, conforming versus non-conforming segments, right? There was execute only and execute read, execute only conforming and execute read conforming. We said we want to use these non-conforming most of the time. And the interesting fact about this was that, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, there's this notion of execute only or execute read, but neither of these are, are writable. And so this was a fundamental thing. There's a security capability, there's a security property that you tend to want, which is writable XOR executable. So you want it to be writable or executable, but never both at the same time. And segments actually originally were designed that way but unfortunately people didn't use them that way and consequently that technology had to be reinvented at the paging level that we'll learn about later. All right, so these system segments, so we were just looking at code and data segments here. So what are the system segments? Well, there was more of them in 32-bit that has been pared down for 64-bit. There's one for the LDT, which is how you specify where in the GDT you find the data structure that points at the LDT. And there's a few more that we'll learn about as we progress through the class. But an interesting bit about this is that system descriptors, meaning these things, in IA32E mode are 16 bytes instead of eight bytes. So when you're looking at something and if you interpret the descriptor field and you look and it has the system flag set to zero, meaning it's a system descriptor, then you can expect that that's going to be a 16 byte entry rather than an eight byte entry. So it effectively takes up two slots of what used to be only eight byte slots. All right, now this is just gonna be relevant to a WinDebug command that I'm going to have you run later. So just as a, a forward reference here for you, uh, the Windows data structure, the KGDT entry 64, 64-bit 64 kernel GDT entry data structure, they have actually chosen to define uh, the type and the system field as a five-byte field. So they have a thing called type, but it's five bits. So I just want you to be careful later on to recognize that type is not just four bits, as you would expect. Type is actually five bits. It's the combination of these two fields. All right, then there's the DB flag, which is actually used for completely different stuff depending on the descriptor type. So there's three different usages for this particular bit 22. So let's go through each of them in turn. If this segment descriptor has a type of code, then this field, bit 22, is called the D field for default opcode size flag. And it turns out that this is a thing which will answer a question that was left lingering in Architecture 1001 about how the processor interprets what are ostensibly the exact same assembly instruction, but sometimes it's 16-bit and sometimes it's 32-bit. So Architecture 1001, we saw this sort of thing in the Intel manual. You would have the definition of an AND instruction being 25, so the opcode byte 25, and then either a word, meaning a 16-bit value, or a D word, meaning a 32-bit value. And we asked the question, how does the processor know whether it should be fetching a word or a D word? Well, it turns out the answer to that is, based on the code segment that this code was found in, is the D flag equal to zero? If so, then the default size is 16, and it's going to fetch a 16-bit value. If the D flag is one, then the default size is 32, and it's going to fetch a 32-bit value. We also saw that you know there's the 64-bit versions of those that are extended using these prefixes that say, okay, now let's let us access the you know 64-bit register space. But you can actually see that for this, 
it does not you know expand up to a 64-bit value uh, it's just still a 32-bit value. It's just there's a prefix that lets you access the 64-bit registers. So anyways, uh, for this, there is, you know, 25 is always going to either expect 16 bits or 32 bits after it based on the D flag, but it turns out that there actually is an extra thing that can override that. So if you're running in 32-bit, sorry, if you're running like 32 or 64-bit code and you say, but I really, really want to access you know, I really want this assembly instruction to be doing AND AX with a 16-bit value. You can actually override the D flag by using a instruction prefix of 66. So if this was essentially 6625, then the processor would know, okay, 66 means override the D flag. It would check the D flag. D flag would say 60, 32 bits. So it would say, well, the override pushes me down to a 16-bit value and then it would expect to pull a 16-bit 16 value, 16 value here. So we'll talk a little bit more about instruction prefixes later, but that's just a, a quick forward reference to let you know that kind of the answer to this comes from the D flag in segment descriptors. All right, well, that was the first use of the DB flag. Then there's another use where if the type of this segment descriptor is a stack segment, meaning it's a data segment that's pointed to by the SS register. Then the DB flag is the B flag. It is the big flag that indicates whether or not pushes and pops are happening essentially 16 bits or 32 bits at a time. So that's kind of like the, the way that it was, you know, opcode sizes were being used for 16 or 32. And again, uh, you would expect this set to, to 1 and you'd get 32-bit pushes and pops, but actually in 64-bit mode, it's going to you know always be using 64-bit pushes and pops. And then finally, if the type of this was a expand down data segment, which I already said is not actually used in practice by pretty much anyone that I've ever seen, uh, then the B, this is again called the B flag, and it has to do with the bounds. Uh, I should probably put a bounds there. And so if it's zero, then the upper bound of this expand down segment is a maximum 16-bit value. And if uh, B is one, then the upper bound of this expand down segment is a 32-bit value, FFFF. But again, no one uses that. So don't worry about that too much. And finally, we get to the interesting bits, DPL, descriptor privilege level. And here we have supersonic showing up to tell us this is what we care about. So if the type of the uh, segment descriptor is a code segment, and if it was a non-conforming code segment, then the DPL would indicate the descriptor privilege level of who is allowed to use that non-conforming code segment. We said non-conforming behaves as you would expect. So if DPL is zero, then only ring zero code can execute from within this segment. If it was conforming, then you know, uh, higher higher ring number, lower privilege uh, code could actually execute it. But we only really want to consider the non-conforming case. Similarly, if this type was a data segment and the DPL was zero, then you would expect that only ring zero code can fetch data, can read and write to and from this segment. So with that, we have another one of the intrinsically important elements of privilege rings on x86. So the first one we saw was DPL in the segment selectors, and now we have, sorry, RPL in segment selectors, and now we have DPL in segment descriptors. So we're almost there in terms of what we need to know, but let's go ahead and finish out segment descriptors. There's also this miscellaneous bit here called the available flag, which has no actual specific usage, but Intel sort of put it out there to say, dear operating system makers, if you want to use it for something we don't know what, feel free. So this is kind of just reserved to not be used by Intel to let OSs use it. All right, there's a picture here that uh, comes from the manuals that kind of is trying to say for code segments on 64-bit mode, so when we're in 64-bit mode, here are the fields that actually are used. It's trying to say basically the, the segment base, which is spread about, and the segment limit, which is spread about, aren't actually used for code segments because it's just going to assume a base of zero and a limit of 2 to the 64 minus 1. But I also think that this is probably a bug in the documentation because elsewhere it says that the granularity bits are not actually used in 64-bit mode because, you know, the limits are not actually used in 64-bit mode. So other than that, you can expect that, you know, things that matter to code segments are, uh, you know, the default size, whether it's 16 or 32-bit, whether it's a 
64-bit segment is it available for anyone to use, present or non-present, DPL for the permissions, and then the various types. All right, and one last type of descriptor, really two types of descriptors that we need to cover, but we're just going to consider it for the thing we've already seen, the LDT. The system segment descriptor for the TSS, which we haven't learned about yet, and the LDT, which we have, so let's just call it the LDT thing. In the JDT, we said there's an entry that points to the LDT, and that entry has been expanded to be 16 bytes large, so that the base address, which previously could only hold a 32-bit value, is expanded to a 64-bit value. So they added some extra bytes here. That's enough to now give us a 64-bit address. So that'll give us a 64-bit address where, in memory, you can find the LDT. So out of this table, we're going to be checking them off as we go along, each of these system things. And while we technically did just see TSS, we're going to come back to that later and look at it in more detail. So LDT, we said all of these things here are 16-byte values. They're larger segment descriptors that can be in the GDT, and these ones can actually be in the LDT as well. 